watching the YouTube stream or the um, the Zoom meeting? I have both open, but I was wondering which is better. Probably Zoom, right? The Got Zoom. It. Okay. Yeah, there's, I'm, I'm just curious if it's actually streaming to that right link now. I did a little bit of messing around here for a second. Got it. Okay, I'll just use the Zoom link then. Uh, I, the big question is going to be if the video quality good enough through Zoom. So the video quality going to YouTube should be the same as I see here on the monitor, but I'm not quite sure what you guys are going to see on your side with Zoom. So you have to let me know if it looks okay or not once we start. Uh, so like I said, I was waiting for uh, one more person, so. So um, remind me, what are you guys using um, the other fibs in the lab already, or are you just, is this the first fib for you? Oh, uh, so I have used uh, fib on Helios, but this is the first time that I'm seeing like the plasma fib Helios. Okay, so I think that you're you're gonna find that apart from a slightly new version of the software this tool is almost identical in operation to the other Helios. So Got it. Um, I'll try to keep it, I'll try to keep the training going as efficiently as I can, but um, you're probably gonna see a lot of, a lot of things that you know already. Got it, okay. Uh, so in terms of just SCM resolution, does this have any difference with the other Helios or is it, are they the same? Uh, so the SEM columns are very, very similar. Uh, it should be nearly the same resolution. Um, there are some, some small, subtle differences, but most likely you're probably not going to notice them. Got it. Okay. The, the big difference with the SEM on this tool is that it doesn't have a lot of the analytical capability that the Helios 650 has. It has um, just a TLD detector and an ETD detector, so it doesn't have the backscatter detector. It doesn't have EBSD. Oh, I see. Okay. It does have EDS. So. Oh, it doesn't have EDS. Oh, I see. Got it it. Does, yeah. So, it, but it's different software. So the the, uh, the other tools use EDX, whereas this one has um, it, a detector made by Thermo Fisher called Pathfinder. Got it. All right, well, I say uh, it's been five minutes here. Let's get started, and if uh, if anyone else joins late, we'll just, um, they can watch the video, I guess, and catch up later. Um, all right, so again, this is the plasma fib. Um, I'm just gonna start off with real quick here with a, the webcam video. So the column, or the microscope itself, uh, is real similar to the other fibs in the lab. Uh, let me get in here. All right. So we still have the same uh, six-inch chamber stage, uh, and we'll vent this in a second. On the front here is the micro manipulator. This is used for doing uh, liftouts or um, probing work. Uh, the plasma fib column itself is this large uh, column up here on the side. It's quite a bit larger than the gallium fib columns. Uh, but inside the vacuum chamber, it actually looks uh, pretty much the same uh, when you're operating the tool. Um, on the back side of the microscope is the gas injector system. It's called the multi-chem. The multi-chem is a little bit different than the other systems. It allows us to inject multiple gases through the same needle. So instead of having uh, a platinum injector and a carbon injector and a silicon oxide injector, we can do 
all of those gases through one needle. Um, and you can blend chemistries and things like that. Uh, the electron column is the vertical column here. Uh, as I mentioned already, it's very similar design to the one that's on the Helios 650. Uh, so in terms of imaging performance, it should be very similar. So the first thing you're going to do when you come in to use this microscope is, let me turn off my uh, camera here. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we have to vent the chamber. And in the microscope UI, excuse me for a second, I'm wheeling my computer cart around the room. All right, in the microscope UI, um, what you're going to do is uh, you, can, you can vent the chamber by two ways. Um, in the user interface up here in the top right, you have the vacuum control area where there's a button to pump and a button to vent the column or vent the chamber, and you can hit uh, the vent here. In the, this newer version of the software, there's another function up here in the top left with this little blue and green arrow that you can push. It's called sample exchange window. And if you select that, it opens up this uh, floating dialog window. And this has a pump and a vent command in it as well. And it's really the, the venting and pumping, it's the same no matter which one you do. Uh, I'm going to show you in a little bit, though, that this sample exchange window is useful because you can select different types of sample holders here. And it actually reconfigures the software slightly depending on which one you pick. Uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions as we go. Uh, I'm happy to go over anything in more detail. Um, just uh, shout out questions. So I'm going to hit the vent button in the sample exchange, and it asks me to confirm uh, that it'll take about three minutes, and we can say vent. The other features that are in the sample exchange window are it has a vacuum tab. Uh, so you can look at the vacuum status of the entire microscope. Uh, you, can look, you can see the ion pumps are functioning. You can see which valves are open and shut. So this is a nice uh, feature if you're um, interested in some of the background functions on the vacuum system. And we have our chamber, chamber scope uh, view here, which shows us what's going on inside the, the system. Does the, uh, the image display look okay to you, for you guys in Zoom, or does it look like fuzzy or anything like that? Uh, the resolution is slightly like better on the YouTube, but it's still like distinguishable. Okay. I know the YouTube quality is was pretty good the last time we did this. YouTube, it'll be like a second or two delay. So if you have both running at the same time, it might be a little odd. Now, nothing on the, the system is going to tell us when the chamber is vented. Uh, after a few minutes, we're just going to walk over and pull on the door. And if the door opens, uh, we can go ahead and load samples. And if it doesn't, then it's still venting.
All right, so my guess is the chamber is vented by now. So if I just go ahead and pull on the door, uh, you can see that the door opens. Uh, just go ahead and carefully pull the door open until it stops, uh, which is right about there. And that will allow you access to uh, the inside of the chamber to load your samples. Now, before I reach in uh, to this chamber, I want to make sure that I put on a clean pair of gloves. Um, I've been wearing these same gloves all afternoon, uh, mainly because of the coronavirus stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go change my gloves because I'm going to assume that my hands are dirty um, and I don't want to transfer any of that contamination to the inside of the chamber. We always keep gloves in the lab. Uh, there should be boxes of each size. So put on clean gloves. All right, now our samples are going to go onto the stage, onto a adapter. Um, so let me see if I can get this a little closer here. Okay, so digitally zoomed in just a little bit there. So um, this is a sample adapter. Uh, we have a couple different styles that we can use on this microscope. Uh, this particular adapter is actually from the Nova down the hall, but a lot of users like this one. Uh, it can be removed by simply grasping it and turning it counterclockwise. until it comes free from the stage rotation plate. And there's no reason that you have to remove this one. I'm just taking it out because uh, I'm going to show you the other adapter as well. Um, so this adapter is adjustable in height by just screwing it uh, either shorter or taller into the stage plate. And then it's locked by turning uh, this uh, cone nut uh, clockwise down against the stage plate and that secures everything in place. Uh, samples go in the hole on the top and there's a uh, 1.5 millimeter hex screw, set screw right there on the side for locking samples in place. So this is one of the adapters you can use. The adapters that came with the plasma fib are uh, this adapter right here, uh, which can hold five samples at the same time. Um, this is also height adjustable. Uh, I really like this one. This is the one we're going to use today. And the other adapter that came with the FIB is this thing. This adapter is basically just a pre-tilt sample holder. Uh, so you can put your samples in these holes on the top, and you can see it's got an angle surface cut onto it. Um, this has a very special function for doing large cross-section FIB cuts. Um, or if for some reason you want to have your samples on a pre-tilt angle, you could use this. But um, this one, other, other than those applications, this isn't a very uh, helpful uh, sample holder for most people. Uh, this holder, you can see it has three, three big uh, bolts on the bottom. This bolts onto the stage. Um, there's, there's locator pins that you have to get uh, correct. So that drops onto the stage just like that. And then you would use, a, I believe it's a 2.5 millimeter wrench to tighten these three bolts and that secures that in place. Um, we're not going to use that right now. So now let's go to the actual holder I want to use today. This is the cross holder. This one is a little different than the ones we have on the Nova and the Helios. Um, it's a little bit newer design. Um, the way this works is you have to put this cylindrical part um, on top of the stage first and then you can drop the uh, threaded bolt down through the middle and turn it. 
clockwise, get the thread started. And this is what we're going to use to adjust the height. So if you turn it clockwise, it gets shorter. If you turn it counterclockwise, it gets taller. Um, and we're going to adjust the height after our samples are on the stage adapter. So let me grab a couple samples here we'll put in. Um, the focus of today is SEM imaging, so I'm just going to put in some kind of easy SEM type uh, samples here. So I'm going to drop, let's see, put that one in there. And then uh, we can use the wrench to tighten the set screw on the side. And I've got a couple other samples we'll put in just for see what see what they look like. Okay, so I got three samples on this particular adapter. Now what I want to do is to measure the height. And we're going to use this um, height gauge to do that. Now this gauge sets onto the flat part of the stage. And what we want to look at is um, what is the tallest feature on the stage in relationship to this uh, reference line uh, that says max. And it's a little bit counterintuitive, but we actually want to set up the stage adapter so that your tallest feature is just slightly um, above this surface, which is where it says max. Now, the interpretation of these lines are the closest working distance you can get to if the sample is, is at those positions. So the lower line has a floor next to it. And if your sample is exactly that tall, it means that you can reach four millimeter working distance with the stage at its maximum height. If your sample is at the max line, it means you can get to one millimeter working distance. Now that's important for SEM if you're doing high resolution SEM. If you're just gonna be using this tool for the fib, fib cuts, um, make sure you're above the four line if you're shorter than the four line, you won't be able to get the sample close enough to the lens to work with the fib. Uh, the stage on this tool has a 10 millimeter range of vertical travel. So if your sample is exactly at that four line, it means you're starting out 14 millimeters away from the bottom of the SEM lens. So if we bring the stage up to its maximum height, which would be plus 10 millimeters, then you end up four millimeters away from the lens. And then the maximum, the max height here actually refers to maximum resolution, but that's, uh, that's for one millimeter working distance. So if you're right at this point, you're actually 11 millimeters away from the lens. So you're still a long way away from uh, crashing into anything. Uh, the top part of this gauge doesn't mean anything. Um, I think Thermo Fisher kind of missed an opportunity here. They could have made that surface uh, relevant but um, you can actually have samples that are a little bit taller than this and they're still okay to uh, load into the microscope. Unfortunately, this gauge doesn't tell you if your sample's too tall, it just tells you if your samples are too short. Um, so try to err on the side of caution, make your samples just taller than the max line and you should be safe. Hey, you should have about 10 or 11 millimeters of clearance below the lens. So once we have our samples on the stage, I'm gonna set this gauge onto the flat part of the rotation plate, and I just carefully try to sweep it over the samples. And I can tell that my samples are about a millimeter and a half too tall right now. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is turn the stage adapter clockwise a few turns. And let's go a couple more, and then we'll try it again. And now, I've made my samples too short. So now that gauge can fit um, clearly over top of my samples, 
which means I won't be able to get to a one millimeter working distance if I want to use the really high resolution SEM conditions. So too short. So let's go back a little bit taller. And that's good. So the gauge just barely catches on the side of my stub. It doesn't clear. Uh, this should be a good, good starting point. Once you have the height set, then we need to uh, lock the adapter in place. Now to do that, we want to expand this cylindrical part by turning the two halves in opposite directions from each other. Uh, what I like to do uh, is just lift up on the cylinder and it'll kind of nest into the bottom of the cross holder and then use your second hand and turn the bottom piece uh, clockwise and it'll make the cylinder expand and it'll eventually just kind of wedge everything together and it'll be nice and secure. Now, uh, it's a little bit hard to show that, a little bit hard to show that with this webcam. Uh, I'm hoping that when you come in to use the tool that this will make sense. Uh, but if you have any questions, you know, please, please come find me or Bobby or any of the other staff and we can show you uh, how this works in person. But I'm, I'm hoping that this will, will make sense. The main the main, main safety feature that you really, really have to do when you load samples, though, always use the height gauge. Always check. Make sure your samples are at the appropriate height because we don't want to close the door and smush the lens. Um, that's about a $35,000 mistake. And I know that because we just had to change the lens out a couple months ago on this tool. So I know exactly what it costs. Um, it would be a bad day to do that. All right, so our samples are all set. So now what we're going to do is we're going to um, look at the CCD camera on the microscope screen, and we're going to carefully close the door. So let me hide this uh, webcam display. So when we have our, um, our live CCD camera view, we can carefully push the door closed and on this microscope, this uh, CCD camera is directly opposite of the door. So as you push the door closed, you'll see the samples coming in from the background. And just make sure that nothing is going to hit the lens. Make sure nothing is going to catch on anything as you close the door. All right, so we got the door all the way shut. And now what we're going to do is to go and hit the pump button on the uh, Microscope. Is it possible to, so for Helios, the regular Helios, you can take images of like image, if you're using the cross section, I mean the cross sample order, you can take an image of that to know which sample is which. Does this one have the same capability or? Yes, it does. So um, I didn't quite get there yet. So on this tool, that, that component is called the nav cam. Yeah, yeah, nav yeah. Cam, yeah. And on this system, the nav cam is actually inside the chamber. So if you um, can see here on my screen that there's a little option right here that says take nav cam photo, and that's selected. So when I hit the pump button, it's going to go over and automatically take that nav cam photo for you. Oh, got it. Yep, got it. So we hit pump. And you see the stage automatically moves into position for the nav cam. So if I close this, um, right, so there's the nav cam image. It's a, it's a much better quality uh, image than on the Helios 650, which is really helpful. Much, much easier to see um, where everything is. Got it. Yep. I also like that the, because the camera is, is rigidly mounted to the roof of the microscope, um, it doesn't drift in position like the Helios 650 does. So it's much more accurate. When you click on a feature on the image, you'll actually be right on that spot. The, uh, the 650 nav cam tends to always be off by a couple millimeters. Yeah. Which is, is kind of annoying. This one is, is better, better calibrated and it stays aligned better. Uh, this microscope will take a couple minutes to pump to high vacuum. 
Um, make sure that if you're going to walk away while it's pumping down, make sure that the door actually closed and pumped. Uh, this, the vacuum system on this one is just a little bit different that it doesn't pull vacuum on the chamber when the pump turns on. It pumps out a reservoir called the buffer chamber or the buffer, which you can see right here. It pumps this out. This is basically just a big empty box. But it pumps that to vacuum and then it opens a valve and uses that vacuum in the buffer chamber to pull on the main chamber. So if you just walk away right when you hear the turbo pump turn on, um, it's possible the door won't be sealed. So you just kind of um, give it another 30 seconds or so longer than you're used to for the other Helios. We have had issues where um, users have walked away and the door didn't seal up and then they come back in 10 minutes and it's still vented. Now in the sample exchange window, uh, we have to tell the microscope software what adapter we're using. So there's three different adapters listed in here. Uh, other accessory, rocking mill holder, and spin mill holder. Uh, I showed you the rocking mill holder already. Uh, we're not using that one, but if you were, you just simply just click on it and it selects that holder. And that tells the software uh, what are safe positions to go to based on this um, holder's geometry. The spin mill holder is a holder that we don't own, but if you want to enable some of the stage moves that this tool can do, uh, you have to select spin mill holder. Um, the biggest thing that this one enables is it allows you to tilt the stage to minus 38 degrees, which is really useful if you want to use the fib to cut off the top of a sample. So the other Helios and the Nova can only tilt to minus 10 degrees on their stage. This one can go to minus 38. So you can get the fib um, at a 90 degree relative angle to the sample. But you have to select spin mill holder to enable that. The other accessory uh, generally refers to all the rest of the holders. So the holder that we have in the system right now falls under this other accessory tab. So we're just going to click other accessory. And that is the basic um, basic holder configuration. And you, if you forget to do this, you can always open up the sample exchange window at any time and just select the different holders. Uh, again, this is this is this button up here in the top left of this microscope. Um, you just click on that and say uh, sample exchange. All right, while we're waiting for the system to pump down, I'm going to move the webcam so that you can see the hand panel controls. Uh, so just bear with me for a minute or two here.
Okay, so the system's pumped down, and let me hide this for a second. And the way that we can tell that the system's pumped down is that there's a little colored icon in the bottom right of the uh, display here. This turns green. That tells us that the vacuum in the system is suitable to turn on the electron beam. Um, we can see the absolute chamber pressure in the bottom left here. So it tells me that uh, right now it's 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 5 torr. Um, it will get better over time. Uh, if you want to do really high resolution SEM, Generally, you want better vacuum, uh, at least into the like 10 to the minus 6 tor range would, would be better. Um, but that takes 30, 40 minutes after you get a sample in. Uh, we can certainly start imaging right away, though. Uh, so to start up, uh, first, let's turn on the SEM. So we're going to click on one of the quadrants in the image. Uh, which quadrant you select tells the software which beam you want to use. So in the bottom left corner of each of the quadrants is a little symbol. Uh, there's a, an electron cloud symbol, which represents the SEM. There's an ion nucleus, which represents the FIB. There's a light bulb symbol, which represents the CCD camera. And then the compass represents the nav cam. And whichever quadrant you select by clicking on it once with the mouse will cause all of the control buttons in the toolbar and in the panel, and also all the functions on the hand panel uh, all apply to that beam. So if you want to change conditions on the SEM, we want to click on a quadrant with the SEM signal shown. If we want to change conditions on the FIB, we would click on a quadrant with the FIB symbol shown. And we can remap the quadrants. If you click on the bottom left symbol, you can change these to different beam types. So if we wanted to, we could make all four images electron beam images. Uh, or all fib um, and so on. The default con condition that you're most likely going to find this tool in is that the top left quadrant is the SEM, the top right quadrant is the fib, the bottom right quadrant is the CCD camera, and the bottom left is the nav cam. Uh, all right, so we click on the top left image quadrant, that's the SEM. And then I'm going to go over here to my panel on the right-hand side of the display. And I want to make sure I'm in the beam control tab. So the older software, the Nova and the Helios 650, have these same tabs, except they run horizontally across the top of the panel. On the newer software, they run vertically down the side. But the same buttons are still there. So the first button is called beam control. This is where you go to turn on and off the, uh, the beam. It's also where you can control things like magnification, stigmators, beam shift, uh, beam deceleration mode, things like that. The second tab is called the navigation tab. This is where you go to move the stage around. Uh, you can save stage positions. Let me remove this one. Um, you have access to your nav cam here. And this is also where you can control dynamic focus and tilt correction if you're working on tilted samples. The third tab is called the detector tab. Uh, this is where you can select the different detectors for your imaging. So we have the Everhart Thornley detector, the through lens detector, and the ion conversion and electron detector on this tool. Uh, the ETD and TLD detectors are mainly used with the SEM, and the ICE detector is generally used with the FIB, but the FIB also uses the uh, ETD detector or the TLD detector if you really want to. Uh, Fourth tab is called the patterning control tab or patterning tab. This is where we will be when we're working with the fib to make uh, fib cuts. The fifth tab is called rocking polish. This is a specific tab to the plasma fib for making very large cross section cuts. Um, it's sort of like an automated wizard that allows you to move the sample in certain positions that allow you to get to get a better um, cut finish than if you're just uh, doing the cut with the regular cross section. Uh, next tab down is the Easy Lift. This is the micro manipulator needle that's on this tool. Uh, the equivalent on the other systems would be the Omniprobe, uh, but the Easy Lift is used for doing fib lift outs mainly. And then we have a direct adjustments button. Uh, this is actually duplicated in the toolbar up here as well. There's another direct adjustments. Um, so you can go to either one depending on what you prefer. And then uh, you have the sample preparation tab 
which is just some features from these preceding tabs kind of combined together. Uh, and then you have alignments. I would uh, recommend that you don't go into the alignments uh, for any reason. Uh, you will have access to some things in here, but you're more likely just going to mess something up on the system. So if you think something's out of alignment, come ask for help and we'll, we'll try to fix it. Um, so just kind of stay out of this tab um, if you wouldn't mind. So let's go back to the, uh, the beam control tab and we're going to click the beam on button and that will open up the column isolation valve and allow us to image with the SEM. So we click beam on and you'll hear the valve open in the room and you also should hear the aperture motors move um, if necessary and then that will allow us to uh, start imaging. Now you see we don't have an image yet in quadrant one that's because our image is paused. Uh, one nice thing about this new software is that these pause things are actually clickable buttons finally. Um, it's something that everyone asked for for years on the other system but um, on this tool you can actually click on the pause button and it starts the image scanning. Now so you can see what I'm doing I'm going to turn on the uh, hand panel webcam. Now the hand panel has the same knobs on it that you will find on the other microscope. Um, that's a little bit out of focus. Let me see if I can fix that. Let's see, properties. All right, I think that's better. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to read the words that are written here, but. Um, the basic ones are the big knob right here is the magnification. Um, oh, this is backwards. You're seeing it differently than what I'm seeing. Uh, slip. Where do I change that? Somewhere I got to flip the image around. Ah, there we go. All right. Now it makes more sense. Now it actually looks the same way that it does for me. Um, all right. So the, uh, the big knob here is magnification. The knob here is coarse focus. This is fine focus. Uh, up here is X and Y beam shift. And then you have X stigmator, Y stigmator. Um, this is image brightness and then image contrast. I don't know why Thermo Fisher decided that they had to change the knob arrangement around. Um, personally, I like the hand panels on the Nova and the Helio 650 better than this one, but um, can't stop change, I guess. So you'll just have to get used to the, the different configuration of the knobs. Um, it definitely prefers uh, operating with your left hand, but I guess if you want to reach with your right hand over here, you can as well. Now there are also some preset buttons on the left here. Um, there's six of them and those can be mapped to different functions. Uh, so I'm not sure if this is visible. Let me, let me expand this a little bit. Um, yeah, that doesn't show up very well. But right now the, the, the six functions show as um, the e-beam snapshot, user fast dwell, coincident height, um, function four is blank, Function five says auto, auto contrast brightness, and then six says uh, tilt 52. So if you push one of these buttons, it will do um, that function. So for instance, if I say uh, e-beam snapshot, and I push this, that'll cause the uh, microscope to take a snapshot. It'd be the same as if I pushed uh, the snapshot button up in the top uh, of the bar. And you can change those functions if you really want to. Um, the way that is done, let me get this back to something kind of reasonable. Right, 
Right. Um, so if you go to your uh, settings or any of the preferences, you can go to uh, where is it? Of course, now I forget where it is. Um, there we go. Customization, uh, the site, the MUI customization. So these are the functions that are mapped to those buttons. So if you wanted to, we could change them. You're only lim you're limited to certain features in the software. You can't assign any arbitrary value to these, but. Um, for instance, I can say, let's make that blank one uh, the photo F2 button and say apply. Uh, this is also where you can change the sensitivity of the knobs um, if they're too fast or too slow for you. Okay, so let's get back to um, the imaging here. So I'm going to click on quad one. We'll go live with our image. Now, if you want, uh, you can make the image full screen by hitting the F5 button on the keyboard. Um, F5 switches you between quad view and full screen view. Uh, this can also be found by going to the uh, view menu and selecting uh, full screen right here. Oops, not that. Sorry. Uh, large image. Oh, here. Sorry. Single quad image mode. There's still some things on this new software that trip me up. Uh, that's one of them. For example, the view dropdown. On the other tool, this is called the window dropdown, not the view dropdown. So they changed just enough to uh, make it a little bit confusing. Uh, but most of the keyboard shortcuts are the same between these tools. So let's um, let's use the nav cam uh, to move around to a sample. So I'm going to go to go to the lowest magnification possible. Uh, let's change our brightness and contrast a little bit so we can uh, see something. And let's just start off with something really easy. Um, I'm going to go over here. This is a uh, light bulb filament. Oh, you can't see that because it's behind the uh, camera view. So on the nav cam, I'm just going to double click uh, where I want to go, and the stage will move to that spot. Now, um, I can see uh, where I want to go here. Uh, these little coily spring things are my sample. And to move those, I can double click the mouse on those features. So if I click twice, that wherever I click will move to the center. Um, another way to move is I can draw a box around a feature and let go with the mouse, and the stage will move to the center. And it will also zoom in to that uh, area. Um, if you click top left and then drag down and right, it goes to higher magnification. If you click on the bottom right and go up and left, it goes to lower magnification. Um, so you can use the mouse to kind of click and drag your way around. Another way to move is to press down on the wheel. So if you click the wheel uh, down on the mouse and hold it down, the mouse acts like a joystick. And then you can uh, drag the mouse and move the stage in various directions. Uh, other ways to move are you can use the arrow keys on the keyboard. Uh, so if I push, for example, the left arrow key on the keyboard, the stage moves by one field of view to the left. Or if I click to the right, it moves by one field of view to the right, and so on. Uh, and I can do up and down and things like that. And those will change with magnification. So if you're at higher magnification, um, it moves a smaller distance. Um, other ways to move are you can go to the navigation tab, and you can type in coordinates or relative coordinates. So if I change my actual drop down to relative and I say I want to move relative one millimeter in X, uh, that will cause me to shift to the right one millimeter, or I can do negative motions to go back the other way. Um, so we have the ability to move in X, Y, Z, tilt, and rotation. Um, when you're making uh, stage moves, keep in mind that the stage can be stopped by hitting the escape key on the keyboard or by um, pushing this button right here, which says go to right now. But uh, if I, let's make a big like rotation or something, it'll take a second. While the stage is moving, this will say stop. So if I click on that, it will stop the stage. So if you think you're gonna crash into something, you know, just hit stop. Uh, or you can hit the escape key on the keyboard. 
Uh, the last position function here always goes back one stage move. So as long as you don't move twice, uh, you can use the last position function to get back to where you were. Now one really uh, maybe useful to, to you, a new feature on this microscope, is there is an undo and a redo button up here in the top left. These allow you to undo software commands. Um, Obviously, if you're, if you're fib cutting, you can't put the material back on the sample. But if I select up here, I can see a list of all my uh, operations going back um, quite, a, quite a ways here. So I can go back to uh, one of those uh, previous conditions if I want to by using the backup, the undo button, or the redo button. Um, so feel free to use those if you, if you want to. Uh, once we find our sample area, the next thing we need to do is to figure out how high this sample is. Uh, let me move this over. Uh, we're starting out at a fairly long working distance here between the, the lens and the sample, and we want to bring that sample up to about four millimeters to start with. But in order to do that, we have to measure what this gap is in the first place. And the way that we do that on these SEMs is by focusing the image. So if I uh, turn my focus knobs, either the coarse or fine focus, and I want to get that image of that sample to look fairly sharp. And by doing so, if you see here, there's a parameter in the data bar called working distance. This changes as you change focus. And if the image looks sharp on the screen, then this number is a good way to measure the distance between the lens and the sample. The one thing you've got to be careful on is make sure your magnification is around uh, 2000 X or higher. It's, if you try to do this focusing at low magnification, it's really easy to mess it up. So what I want to do is just turn up my magnification. So I'm about 2000 X or so, and then just make sure that I'm in focus. Now, I have a lot of astigmatism in this image. Uh, if you can see that, as I go back and forth through focus, you can see there's a lot of like um, diagonal stretching or diagonal smearing going on here. Uh, I'm gonna fix some of that because this is really obnoxious to me. So I think I'm pretty close to focus and then I'm gonna change my stigmator and stigmator Y and get that a little better. All right, not bad. So 9.8 millimeters is the distance between the lens and the sample, and I want to tell the microscope to use that as my reference for the z-axis. So when you start off on the FEI software, uh, the z-axis will show that you're at zero millimeters, and it shows that the positive direction is up. Once I get in focus, I will push this link Z to FWD button up here in the toolbar, and that will couple uh, whatever this number happens to be over here to the z-axis. So I'm going to go ahead and push that, and it's going to change from this little red question mark icon to an up and down arrow. And the 9.8 millimeters in the, in the data bar has now gone over here to the z-coordinate. And the positive direction for z is now down. So make sure you know which way your z-axis is pointing, because if I type in zero millimeters after I click the link button, that will cause the sample to go up towards the lens. If I type in zero millimeters before I click the link button, it'll cause the stage to go to its lowest height. Uh, so positive being down means that large numbers move me away from the lens. But you wanna work in this link space because this tells you um, the distance to the lens, which for microscopy, that's a much more important parameter than the raw height of the stage. Uh, now, since we're linked, I'm going to highlight Z. I'm going to change it to four millimeters, and then I'm going to hit go to or the enter key on the keyboard, and that'll cause the stage to raise up to approximately four millimeters. Now, if you want your sample to be exactly at four, I recommend you do this entire focus and link procedure twice. So we bring it up to four millimeters, and then I'm going to uh, focus a second time on the surface of the sample. Let me just 
fix my stigmator. And you can see that I'm actually at 4.2 millimeters in the, in the data bar, but the stage still thinks I'm at exactly four. So I just click the link button a second time, and then I can type in four again, and now I should be right at four. Now, let's say I want to uh, find other samples. I can save this as a position, so I'm gonna click add, and that creates position one in my saved position list. I can click on it twice slowly, and I can rename it uh, filament. And now I can come back to this spot anytime I want. So let's say I want to go to another sample. Um, let's go over here on the, the FBI alignment stub, and let's uh, let's go look at this TEM grid. So I can click on the TEM grid. That'll move me over here. Now this sample's at a different height. It's a little bit uh, shorter, I think, than the light bulb filament. So when I get over there, I see that I'm not in focus anymore. Every time you move to a new sample, the first thing you always want to do is refocus on the surface and then update the link on the working distance. So by uh, focusing on this sample, I can see that this surface is actually 4.9 millimeters away from the lens. But because the working distance link is still based on the, the light bulb filament sample, the z-axis still shows that I'm at four millimeters. So when I go to a new sample, I need to click on the link z to fwd. That updates the link value to this new height. And then if I want this sample to be at four millimeters, I can type in four, and that will move this one to four millimeters. And then I can save, I can click add, and I can save this position um, as a second spot. So let's just call this grid. Now one frustrating fact about all of the FEI software is that they don't remember the link values with the saved position. So when I go back, uh, if I double click on the light bulb filament, it remembers the stage position. So the stage will go back to a lower height, but it doesn't remember that the working distance link was different. So the z-axis now thinks it's at 4.8 millimeters instead of four because the reference height is off this shorter sample. So when I get back to the light bulb filament, I have to focus on that surface. And update my link and you can see that I'm right at right at four millimeters still. Um, but the software just doesn't know the difference between the different sample heights. All right, now I notice this particular sample seems to be vibrating a lot. It's probably because it's a big suspended spring. Um, I'm gonna move around a little bit here and find, find an area that's a little bit closer to where it's glued down because it'll be a little bit more uh, secure and a little bit less shaky. So something like right here should be fine. And since this is a new spot, really what I should do is just make sure that if I focus and check my link, I should be good here. Now if I want to update my position, I'm just going to click on the filament and say update. And it'll say, do you want to update this position? I say yes. So now where I'm at right now is my new save position. So let's look at uh, setting up the SEM for imaging. Uh, we have a couple uh, main parameters we want to look at for SEM imaging. The first choice you want to make is going to be your accelerating voltage. The accelerating voltage is selectable in this drop-down menu uh, up here at the top. These give you access to preset voltages. Uh, so there's, what, about 10 values here in this list. So if I want to change voltage, say I want to go to 3 kV, I can just select 3, and that will change the SEM accelerating voltage to the uh, lower value. Don't feel like you, you're forced to use these values. You can also go to the beam control tab and you can go to high voltage and you can type in any number that you want. So if I want to be at 2.8 kV, I can do that or 3. Point whatever. So don't feel like you must use those preset values. Uh, you can change the appearance of some of these functions. There's a little like slider bar version. So I can change it to a slider mode, um, or you can change it to uh, this mode and type in values. Uh, 
I believe this software always works in kilovolts. The Nova and the Helios 650, I believe, operate in volts. So just you know, watch out for that, that you don't accidentally send it to 30, 30 volts if you mean 30 kV uh, or the vice versa. After you choose your accelerating voltage, the next thing we want to look at is the beam current. The beam current is selectable by this drop-down menu here in the toolbar. Uh, we are limited to these specific beam currents. I think there's 20 of them. And you can simply select the beam current that you want. Uh, the smaller beam currents at the top of the list are going to be good for really high resolution imaging, but you're not going to have a lot of signal. Um, the beam currents from maybe 50 picoamps to about 0.4 nanoamps or so, these are kind of the middle range beam currents. They're good for all around imaging purposes. And then when you get higher than about 0.8 nanoamps, you start to get into the analytical current range, which is really good for doing uh, EDS analysis or if you're going to do depositions uh, using the SEM, uh, you want to be up here in these higher beam currents. Uh, for now, I'm just going to pick the 0.1 nanoamp beam current. Um, I find that's a good combination of uh, resolution versus signal. And now we're going to proceed with aligning our, our microscope. To access the column alignments, uh, we want to open up the direct adjustments panel, which is either here in the toolbar at the top, or you can go over to the right and click on direct adjustments um, on one of these panel tabs as well. In the direct adjustments, uh, I'm going to open up this one because I like it better. The first thing we're going to look at is called source tilt. And source tilt is going to change the angle that the electron beam comes down the column. And ideally, we want the electron beam to be both parallel with the column axis and also passing down the center line of the aperture. Now, we don't have any control over the position of, of the um, beam as it comes down the column, but we can change the tilt angle. So the, um, the other parameter, which is called source shift, is done by us on a, about every couple of weeks. We'll, we'll do a master alignment of source shift. But the source tilt is adjustable via this uh, 2D adjuster. In order to see the column center line, we want to turn on the crossover button. This changes the scanning on the microscope so that you can see um, the virtual uh, center of the optic axis. In crossover mode, if I click and drag the source tilt around, I will cause this bright circle to move around on the screen. And the center of the optic axis is marked by this green uh, crosshair. So all I need to do is drag, drag the bright spot to the center of the green crosshair. And that's it. We're done with source tilt. So I can then click crossover, go back to regular imaging mode, and we can uh, work, proceed to the next alignment step. So the second alignment is called lens alignment. Uh, lens alignment is going to shift the position of the beam lower down in the column so that it passes through the center of the lens, uh, or the center of the lens field. And the way that we find that center is by turning on the lens modulator. And we're, with the modulator on, we're looking for motion in the image. Now, I would recommend that you go to a little bit higher magnification and make sure that you have your focus um, and astigmatism close before you try to do this. Uh, you have to be able to see features in order to do the uh, lens alignment. So I can see, you know, there's some texture here. So I'm going to turn on the HV modulator. And I can see that that image is shifting a little bit as it goes back and forth in focus, uh, kind of in this uh, diagonal direction. And what I want to do is drag the lens alignment either left or right and up and down to try to get rid of that motion in the image. Now, if you drag the lens alignment to the right or left, it will either add or subtract to the horizontal part of this wobbling. And if you drag it up and down, it'll add to the vertical or subtract to the vertical part of the wobble. So I usually try to focus on one direction at a time. So there, I've got rid of the horizontal wobble. It's just shaking up and down. And then I can move the lens alignment uh, either up or down and try to get rid of the vertical wobble. And that looks pretty good. Uh, so source tilt first, then lens alignment. Now, if you're doing really, really high resolution imaging, you're also going to want to look at this second tab called stigmator centers. 
The Stigmator centers are uh, aligned the same way as lens alignment, so they have a modulator that you're going to turn on, and then um, you can change the amplitude if you want. But you're looking for image shifting uh, as it wobbles, and you can move the Stig Center X adjuster, or you can turn on and move the Stig Center Y adjuster to get rid of the image shaking. I usually don't worry about these unless I'm doing really high res imaging. Um, there's a default alignment that will be loaded that is usually pretty close. So uh, again, I wouldn't worry about it too much unless you're really pushing the tool. All right, so we've got our alignment done. So we can turn off direct adjustments. Uh, the last thing we would need to do is fine tune our focus and astigmatism. Uh, I'm gonna hit F5 to go to full screen and let's uh, slow down our scanning. Scan speed adjuster is up here in the top of the toolbar, so you have a plus and minus button. The minus button makes it scan faster. The plus button makes it scan slower. You can also just click on the drop down and go to any scan speed that you want. The resolution in the image is controlled by the number of pixels. Um, you can change the resolution as you see fit. Uh, 1536 by 1024 is a pretty common resolution on these tools. But you also have the, um, the legacy resolutions like that you get on the Nova. So for instance, like the 1024 by 884 resolution. Uh, to help with focusing, there is a reduced area function up here. And you can turn on reduced area. And this gives you a small little window that you can drag around and put it on top of a feature. Um, this one has its own set of scan speeds that is independent of full screen mode, so you can change that and then uh, try to get your image to look uh, decent. Now, it probably uh, shows a poor sample to start with. There's not a whole lot on this sample to see until we turn on the high resolution lens. Um, but we can go to lower magnification here and just take a picture of this thing. To acquire images, uh, there's three main ways to do this. The first way is just slow down your scan speed until the image looks acceptably good, and then hit the pause button. So if you hit the pause button once, the image will complete its uh, scan, and then it will freeze. And then you can save whatever is on the screen as a file. So the image is frozen. I can go to File. I can click Save or save as, and I can go and save that image somewhere. The uh, second way to get an image is by using the snapshot tool, which is this little camera icon right here next to the image resolution. And the snapshot is going to acquire an image using some predetermined scan speed. The third way is called the photo preset, which is uh, the photo is the camera button just to the right of snapshot. The photo preset is your slow scan speed. So each of these buttons does a different uh, predetermined scan condition. Now, if I hit pause once during a photo, it will still complete the whole scan and then, and then stop. If I hit pause again, it stops immediately. And you can see I only have half an image here. And then if I hit pause a third time, it goes back to live scanning. You can change the conditions for the snapshot in the photo by either going to the preferences uh, dialog and choosing scanning. Or uh, one thing I'd like on this new software is you can right click on these icons and click edit and it takes you directly to these um, adjustments. In the scanning window you can also change your live scan speeds. So for example I have uh, live scanning speeds of 1, 3, 5, 10, 20, and 30 microseconds. Let's say, for example, I wanted to have a, a 100 microsecond scan speed. I can click on one of these values. Um, let's just use the one here. And I can change it to 100 and hit apply. And now I have a 100 microsecond scan speed available in my list. You're, you only get a certain number of these scan speeds, however. So if you want to add new speeds, you have to change one of the existing ones to the new value that you want. The two cameras down at the bottom are the snapshot and the photo presets. These can be set to any condition that you want. So for right now, the snapshot is set to a one microsecond dwell. Um, it's going to do 1536 by 1024 resolution. You can also do um, frame integration uh, up to uh, 512 
uh, I think you can type in, yeah, you can type in any number that you want, or if you use the preset list, it only gives you powers of two. But um, you can do frame integration. You can also do uh, line integration up here. So line by line integration sometimes is nice uh, versus doing frame by frame integration. If you do frame integration, you have the option of using drift correction, which is uh, really, really fantastic. I suggest you use that um, as much as you can. But you can turn that off if you want. Um, there are some tricky samples where the drift correction will actually make your image look worse than if you don't use it, but it's an, it's an exception. And then action is what happens after the image is acquired. So you can click save, uh, save as, or none. So if I choose save as and then acquire this image by snapshot, it will bring up the file save window for me automatically and I can choose to save the image. Now, um, let's, I'm not going to save any images here because uh, I think hopefully you get the idea. But um, let's now look at the high resolution lens mode because this sample is much more interesting in that condition. Uh, when you start off on the microscope, you're going to be using the low resolution objective lens. But if we want to take pictures of anything smaller than a couple hundred nanometers, uh, it's a good idea to go to the high resolution lens mode. And the way you switch to lens mode is this icon up here in the top of the toolbar that has like a little single lens on it. And if I hover the mouse over it, it says switch to SEM mode 2, immersion mode. You can also click on this little drop down. You can see there's actually three choices here. Mode 1 field free mode is the low resolution objective lens. Mode 2 immersion mode is your high resolution objective lens. And mode 3 EDX mode is a combination mode that uses both of these lenses at the same time. And that's mainly used for doing uh, EDS analysis. So if I want to switch to the high resolution lens, I just simply either click this icon or I can click the drop down and click to mode 2. Now, a couple things happen when you switch to mode 2. Well, the first thing is that the lens switches over to the high resolution lens. The second thing is that the detector will automatically switch to the through lens detector. There are three detectors available for the SEM, but when you use the high resolution lens mode, you can only use the through lens detector. So it switches automatically for you. Because we're using a different detector and we're using a completely different lens, you should expect that all of your imaging conditions will be messed up. So we need to start over with focus and then do the column alignment and brightness and, and um, contrast adjustment. So let's zoom in here a little bit. We'll start with focus. And there's a lot of image motion when I'm adjusting focus, which tells me my lens alignment's not very good. So let's go ahead and fix that. So we're going to start with crossover. Move the source tilt to center the bright spot on the green X. And then we'll go find a relatively small feature. I'm going to make the scan speed a little faster. We'll turn on the HV modulator. And we want to fix any lens alignment problems. So again, I'm moving lens alignment to get rid of motion in the image. And then I can do focus and astigmatism. And let's slow down the scan speed a little bit. And let me see if I can find. So the only thing that I think is interesting on this sample is there's these little like tungsten oxide particles that form on the light bulb filaments. And I think they're kind of cool to look at. They're relatively small though. Let's see if I can find a pile of them. Of course, I don't see any right now here. Let's move to another part of the wire. I don't know. Here's, there's one right here. They're, they're kind of these little, like, crystal-y polygon things. All right, so let's get my image better. Focus. Stigmatism, yeah, it looks pretty good. Adjust my brightness, contrast. And then I can go ahead and take my image. So I'm going to right click on uh, my settings. 
let's change my photo preset. I really like something like 20 microsecond scan speed and let's do uh, 1536 pixels and we can do a save as when it's done. That's good. So then I'm going to click photo and we'll get a photo. So when we go to save our images, uh, they're going to go onto the support computer hard drive. Uh, that should be mapped out on here. So if you just look, there's a, a folder, a network location folder called PFIP temporary user data. This location is on the uh, support computer, which um, if you're in the room, it's the monitor to the left of the microscope monitor. So you can save all of your image data to that PC. And then at the end of your session, we can move that image data from the support computer onto the file server uh, for saving your data. So I'm going to go in here, I'll go find a folder for myself and we can save it. Now, um, if you're using, especially if you're using the FIB and the SEM at the same time, what you'll find is that if I go in here and make a folder, let's just call it training, and I save my image here, I'll just call it filament and say save. Now let's say I take an image with a fib um, on the same sample. If I click on my fib quad and do file save as, this quadrant defaults to a different file path. So I have to go and navigate back around to that same folder to uh, establish a new directory link for that quadrant. One of the things you can do is if you open the sample exchange window is there's a working folder option here that if I edit this, and point the working folder to that same directory. Um, so temporary data, training, and say OK. This will then automatically point all four quadrants to that same file path. So let's say I want to save my CCE camera image. If I click down here and say File, Save As, it automatically goes to that folder for me because I told the software to apply that to all four quadrants at once. So it can save you a couple mouse clicks if you set that up. So again, then just open sample exchange and then edit the working folder uh, up here. Now, once you've saved an image, um, let's do another. I'm just going to say file, save as again. The software won't overwrite your previous image. So you see it, it took my first sample name filament and added 001 to it. And uh, so I can just click save again and it'll make a new, new image. Um, I just want to point out that there is some options down here that you need to be aware of. One is you can choose to save the data bar or not. And the second one is to save overlaid graphics. I don't know if this is a software bug or, or, or if it was designed intentionally, but this save overlaid graphics has a slightly different uh, result compared to the Nova and the Helios 650. And you probably want to turn this off for most of the time. And the reason is, if I click Save Overlay Graphics, even though I don't have any overlay graphics on here, this version of the software treats that little yellow crosshair as an overlay graphic. So if I were to um, go open up that image, you'll see that the little crosshair is stamped um, of course, it's really hard to see there, but um, the crosshair will be stamped into the center of the image. If I go back right here, you can see it without the noise. So this is really annoying to me. Uh, the Helios 650 and the Nova don't do this. It, those never save that crosshair. But um, just be aware that this tool, if you leave the um, that selection up, that it will save that crosshair for you every time. The ways around it are either to go file, save as, and turn off the overlay graphics option, or you could go to view and you can turn off the center crosshair marker and then it won't save. But I find it's really nice to have the center crosshair up, so for me this is a big frustration, but just be aware of it. You're, so I, I don't want you to end up with a whole bunch of little weird crosshairs in all your images you get off this tool. 
Um, so watch out for that one. <clears throat> So do you guys have any questions? Um, I, I know it's kind of speedy run through of some of the SEM options. Uh, I can show you some more of the, uh, the more advanced SEM imaging um, as we go here, but I want to make sure I'm addressing any questions you have. All right, well, let's keep moving on here. So let's go to another, what's that? Um, all right, so let's go over to a different sample, um, and we can look at some of the other performance here. Now, I could leave the, the high-resolution SEM mode, but I don't have to. As long as I trust my nav cam, uh, I'm just going to double-click and move over here to this other sample. And let's see. Yeah, I, I'm not close enough. So I'm going to switch back to mode 1. This allows me to go to lower magnifications. And I can find my sample. Um, and then let's go back to the high resolution lens mode. Uh, unfortunately, when you change uh, the lens modes, it can throw off the column alignment a little bit. So best practice would be if you switch this back to mode 1 and then back to mode 2 is just double check your alignments. Um, so this sample is a, is a platinum spark plug from a car engine. Um, I really like to use this one to show uh, some of the backscatter functions on the microscope. So if we, uh, let me just adjust my focus here a little bit. Focus, you see my astigmatism's off a little bit. Uh, right now we're imaging in uh, secondary electron mode with the TLD detector. Secondary electrons do a really good job of showing you surface topography, but they don't really show you different uh, compositional signals. Uh, backscatter detectors would do a good job of showing you where the different materials are on a sample like this. We don't have a dedicated backscatter detector, but we do have a backscatter mode that you can choose. So if you select the backscatter mode um, of the detector, that will help emphasize uh, where the high atomic number and low atomic number of materials are uh, on this uh, sample. Now, unfortunately, when you change those, length, those detector modes, it does affect your focus and astigmatism. Um, so be aware of that. You're going to have to fix your image after you change this. Um, let me get this better. So focus. There we go. And I can probably do better with that image. That's not very good. Uh, let's see here. So let's let's check our alignments. So a little bit of lens alignment. It's mainly just focus and astigmatism problems here. All right, good enough. So in a backscatter image, uh, anything that is bright, you can probably assume that it's higher atomic number. Uh, anything that's dark would be potentially lower atomic number. So in this case, with my backscatter image, I can tell that I have two different distinct materials here. Now, I've done EDS on these. I know that the bright stuff is platinum and the dark stuff is carbon. Um, but this imaging mode does a really good job of, of showing the differences between those two. And you can look all, all around on this kind of sample and you can see where all the carbon is versus all the platinum. So all the dark stuff is carbon and so on. Uh, some other 
neat things you can do with this detector um, is it has four preset modes, secondary electron backscatter, charge, neutralizing, and downhole visibility. The one I really like though is the custom mode. Uh, all these modes do is they just change the voltage on two electrodes in the column. One's called the suction tube and the other one's called the mirror. So if I go back to secondary electron mode, you can see that the suction tube is at plus 70 volts and the mirror is at minus 15. Um, in backscatter mode, it's minus 245 and zero. Um, in charge neutralizer mode, it's zero volts and minus 15. And downhole visibility is uh, positive 245 and minus 15 on the mirror. Each of these modes has its own intended purpose, but the custom mode allows you to basically play around with these electrodes as you see fit um, to try to uh, enhance your image. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go up to a higher beam current. Uh, let's go up here to like 0.4 nanoamps. Uh, let me check my source tilt alignment, make sure that this is good. And under these conditions, I'm going to find some stuff over here that's not very conductive. Uh, this stuff is like a graphite kind of material, and it's charging up a little bit. Especially if I park the beam on it, slow the beam down, um, doesn't look very nice. You can get around this type of problem by coating your sample with gold or platinum or something conductive. But I can also get around this by using the detector as an image filter. So the idea is that in uh, this type of sample, the low energy secondary electron signal that we're using is, is affected by this charge buildup, but the backscatter signal uh, is not. So if I switch to backscatter, um, of course it's not going to do what I want. So maybe this is, I, I should probably drop my voltage down a little bit. It's always happened, trying to show, make a demonstration and then it doesn't do what you want it to do. All right, so we're down at 2 kV now, 0.4 nanoamps. Um, again, we have charge, charge problems here. And let me get this a little bit nicer. All right, so charge problems. And if I switch from secondary to backscatter mode, um, we should usually see some of that charge go away. And maybe this is just a terrible spot for this demonstration. But Yeah, let me find a little bit different area. This, this type of um, problem, this only works for like slightly insulating samples. Uh, you can't do this with like a glass slide or something. Okay, so let's try it here. There we go. So in this spot, you can see the backscatter image is not charging up very much, but the secondary electron image uh, is. So you can image slightly insulating samples in backscatter mode, and they usually work better. Now, if we want, um, we can get a little bit of signal back by using the custom mode. So if I go back to secondary electron mode and change then to custom, uh, what I can do is play around with the suction tube. And I want to try to find the voltage where the charge just goes away. So right about there. So maybe about negative 210 volts or so. So it's a little bit more signal than you'd get it going all the way to the backscatter condition, but um, a lot of times you'll find that it only needs minus 10 or 30 or so volts to do this. Now, if I want to get an image of a spot like this, if I slow down my scan speed, I get my charge problem returning. And that's just because the, that long dwell time is still uh, it's kind of overwhelming the capability of this detector to filter out that signal. So what I want to do is I want to do fast scan speeds. And still a little bit of charge right there. And I want to do frame integration. So if I go to my snapshot condition and say I want to do 50 nanoseconds dwell time. 
and I'm going to do integrate, uh, let's just do 64 frame integration with drift correction turned on and let's see what this looks like. So the integrated image should look pretty nice. Um, it's a little bit out of focus, so I can, uh, let me see if I can get that a little bit better. A little bit of astigmatism. Not too bad. You can see the structure in there. You can see there's some little platinum nanoparticles wedged and buried down in there in the graphite. Um, if you try to do this with just a slow scan, um, not it doesn't look too great. So that's one way to deal with a somewhat challenging sample is to use these detector modes, um, try to filter out charge. Uh, <clears throat> The other way to do this, and on a Helios, this, this makes more sense, is to simply drop your voltage. So as you go down and lower and lower voltage with your SEM, um, you'll find it becomes easier and easier to image samples like this that charge up. So if I drop down to 1 kV and look in here, um, still charging up a little bit. So let's go a little bit lower. So. I don't have anything lower in my preset, but below 1 kV. So I'm going to go over here to my voltage. Let's try um, 500 volts. <clears throat> now the trick here is that as you go down in voltage, especially when you get below 1 kV, you're going to start losing image resolution. So the hope is that you can get rid of the charge buildup before you run out of resolution um, to see what you got to see. And I definitely need to check my alignments. The minimum voltage you can image with a Helios is 350 volts. Now we can go lower than that by using a module called beam deceleration, um, but I'm going to try to avoid doing that for now. Well, it's not great, but um, Hopefully you can see the idea is that there's less charge problems going on here at 500 volts than there were at uh, 3 kV or 2 kV. Um, you also find that uh, you get a lot of different signal types of image contrast when you start playing around with your voltages. So like at 500 volts, I can see like a lot of this carbon looks a lot darker than it did um, at the one or two kV. So sometimes you, you can see different things by just changing voltage. Um, beam deceleration is an option over here. This is um, this allows us to apply a potential to the sample to slow down the electron beam as it approaches the surface. Beam deceleration will let us get our landing energy down all the way to 50 volts if we really want to. Um, so if you want to image uh, lower than, than say 350 volts, this is really good. Uh, beam deceleration works best on big flat samples. So like a big piece of silicon or something like that is great. A sample like this that has a lot of topography, uh, this is maybe not going to work well. But we can try it. So if I just click on for beam deceleration, that turns on the, the stage bias. And once beam deceleration is on, you can then uh, tell the software how much bias to put on here. 
Uh, I would it, it allows you up to 4,000 volts, but I would start maybe around 1,000. So let's put 1,000 volts on the sample. And the system will increase the accelerating voltage of the electron column to compensate. So we're still landing on the surface at, oh, you can't see that because this is in the way. Um, we're still landing with 500 volts on the sample, but I have 1,000 volts applied to this stage. So that means that the acceleration voltage in the column is actually 1,500 volts. And now um, I can go lower than, uh, than previously um, allowed. So three, 350 is no longer my minimum with stage bias on. So let's say I want to go down to like 200 volts. And what you will find is that you get better image quality with stage bias, assuming your, your sample behaves than without it. Um, but it, again, it works best for flat samples because all this topography on the sample um, acts as like little lens distortions and it can really throw off your, um, your resolution of your stem. So we'll check our alignment, focus. Yeah, this sample's not cooperating. Uh, so I can get a pretty decent image here, but if you notice, my stigmators are way off in the corner of the range. And that's just because this sample is, is distorting the image so badly. Um, but you can see I've got some really nice, uh, nice images here at 200 volts. Uh, but if I did this on a flat sample, it'd be much better. Um, and even this, uh, another thing you can do is if I go back to the low resolution lens, um, you can kind of get an idea of where the best spot on your sample is for doing beam deceleration or stage bias, because there'll be a, um, there'll be kind of like a bright spot. So like you can see that the bright center is like right here, um, which makes sense. This is more of a flat area of the sample. Um, but that kind of going over here would be better. Um, another thing that helps with beam deceleration is to go closer to the lens. So instead of uh, operating at four millimeter working distance, if I bring the sample up to say two millimeters, uh, this usually works better. So we can go to navigation and let's go to two. So in situations like this, um, I have like zero image at all. So let's uh, go a little bit further away from the lens and see if I can get my image back. Hmm. Oh, there it is. All right, so getting all kinds of distortion from this sample, which is not going to make this easy.
anyway, the idea is that you can go to really low um, low landing energies if you if you care to um, on this tool. And and if my sample was flat, we would be able to see some really small stuff uh, very very well. But this is not a good sample for beam deceleration. So we we'll turn off beam deceleration. And we can go back, let's just go back to say 2 kV. Let's try 50 picoamps. Now, if you're trying to um, look at really small particles, I would say anything in the 10 nanometer kind of size range or up should be pretty easy to image with this tool. Um, once you go below 10 nanometers, things start to get pretty tricky. But you probably will be able to see smaller features. Um, for example, here, if I find a nice small stuff. Um, there we go. So these little nanoparticles. Um, uh, well, those are probably work. So without trying too hard there, um, I can let's let's put a measurement on there. The measurement tools are up here in the top right, uh, so I can choose. Uh, let's see, let's do a circle measurement, and we can just put a circle on one of these little guys here, and you can see that some of these small features are on the order of 10 nanometers or so in diameter. Um, obviously, these bigger ones are like 30, 40 nanometers. Those are pretty easy to find. Um, but again, going smaller than, than about 10 nanometers, you really have to um, work at it to see features like this. If you have a measurement uh, selected, if you want to get your mouse back, you have to go up here to the top and click on the mouse pointer, um, and that returns your control back as the mouse, and then you can use the mouse uh, functions. So let's go back to field tree mode. And um, that's about everything that I wanted to show you for the basic SEM operation. Um, so the last thing would be just shutting down the microscope. So let's go back to four millimeters. Unless there's a, anything I, I can show you um, specifically. All right. So the shutdown procedure is pretty uh, simple. It, it's more or less the reverse of what we did to load the sample. So we're going to go to the beam control tab. We're going to click beam on. And that will turn off the SEM beam. And if we were using the FIB, we would also want to click on the FIB quad and say beam on as well. And then we can click vent. And when you hit vent, the sample exchange window opens up for you automatically. Um, or you can go select it, and that will cause the chamber to vent, and we'll go in, we'll take our samples out, and then close the door and hit the pump button to uh, return the system to high vacuum.
Uh, always leave the tool under vacuum when you're done. Uh, we don't ever want to leave the chamber open longer than a few minutes. So if you need time to, look, to get a sample ready, uh, wait until the sample's uh, ready to go in the microscope before you vent the chamber. Uh, that will keep everything nice and clean. So I will keep the, um, the video feed going here as I take the sample out. But um, if you don't have any uh, questions, then we'll be done here in just a few minutes. And I will give uh, you guys both daytime access to the PFIB. And you can come in and use it. And I will be hosting another training session on this tool, um, I believe, next week. That will be more specific to the FIB applications of the system. So. Uh, I think, as, unless anyone has any preferences, I'll probably just make a TEM sample. And as I do that, I'll go through how to use the FIB, how to use the gas injector, how to use the easy lift needle, things like that. But uh, that should be, I think, next week. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Yep. So, um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, anytime, send me email. Uh, I usually respond to email really fast. Um, even if it's like at night, I'll, I'll probably respond. Um, and yeah, we'll be around the lab to help you guys if you need it. Got it. Yeah. remember put on a clean pair of gloves when you go to change your sample so I've been touching the keyboard and the mouse and everything so my gloves are dirty always try to keep the inside of the chamber clean Uh, loosen the set screws, take samples out. Check with the height gauge, make sure we're good, not going to hit anything. Um, we should probably lock this down so it's just not wiggling. That's good. Carefully close the door and again look at the CCD camera as you do this. Put the door shut and then we go hit the pump button.
All right. With that, I think we'll call it a day, and I look forward to seeing you guys around in the lab. Yep. Thank you, Adam. Yep. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.